Today we are venturing on a holy ground and our topic for the day is holy faith, holy faith. Our text for this morning is coming from the book of Revelation. We will do verse 8 through 10, 8 to 10. And the Bible says, To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. No, sorry, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. That text is talking about the second church among the seven churches of Asia and this church which is called Smyrna the description that is given by Jesus to John is that Jesus Christ himself is saying because the words are given by him who is the first and the last that description only is telling you that the, the person talking is the divine. And the divine is giving a description and is telling the faithfuls of the church and says, I know your works. I know your afflictions. And I know your poverty. Two things, descriptions that are given is that in the church of Smyrna, they are afflicted, there is persecution, and there is poverty. But even though there is poverty, they are rich. I just wanted to tell you that the seven churches in Asia were real churches during the early, the New Testament, the early church. And they were in like a circle. You, if you look at them, you, the, the first church I started is the church of Ephesus, then the church of Smyrna, you can see Pagamos, you can see Theatira, you can see Sardis, you can see Philadelphia, and you can see Laodicea. So when a letter was written to one of them, they could pass it over so that all the churches could read the, the, the message. And I wanted to tell you that the messages that were written to, this, to these seven churches, there were three kinds of interpretations that you need to understand. There was a local interpretation, there was a universal interpretation, and there was historical interpretation. Three. Local interpretation, universal interpretation, and uh, historical interpretation. 
The local interpretation means if God is talking about Laodicea and telling them that I wish you were, okay, God is telling them that you are neither hot nor cold. You are lukewarm. I wish you were either. Then it, there was a situation in Laodicea that the water that they had, they had good things. But the problem was water. The stream that was passing through was coming from hot springs. So it was coming when it was lukewarm. You are thirsty and you want water to drink, but the water is lukewarm. So that was a local interpretation. And you will find them in all the churches. But the message, spiritual message that is given to Laodicea can be used by the church of Ephesus. That is universal interpretation. Again, you talk about historical interpretation. When you talk about historical interpretation, means that these seven churches is bringing to us the period of the people of God. How they dealt with God since the, the crucifixion of Christ. And that period runs till Christ will come the second time. And it could be equated to some years, like you can see the church of, uh, of Ephesus can be equated to, uh, which started in around 31 AD to about 100 AD. And it has a predominant characteristic, which is called the declining love. Their love was diminishing. And then we have the second church, which is the church of Smyrna, which we are talking about today. And the period was about 100 AD to 313 AD. And the predominant characteristic that they went through, that period was a period of persecution. Another church, the third church, is the church of Pagamos. The church of Pagamos it was a period of entering into darkness. After persecution, things feel like it is easing, but there is a compromise. The church is united with the state. And then apostasy, compromise and apostasy, predominant characteristic. And you see the fourth church is the church of Theatira, which is 538 AD to about 1563. Those years you can say about, about because not very exact. And it is still compromise. And then the next church is the church of Sardis, which is, was a church of spiritual death. And you know those years were years when reformation, they, they went into a lull. And the second last church is the church of Philadelphia. The church of Philadelphia, which was the church of religious awakening. The reform was coming to the church. And this church is also like the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. They have no rebuke in the Bible. Spiritually, they were very bright. This is not prophecy lesson, my dear friends. And the last church is the church of Laodicea, 1844 to the second advent. This church, I fear it for one thing. The predominant characteristic of this church, I really fear, and it is where we are now. I wish one time we preach also about, about, about Laodicea, because it is spiritual arrogance. Everyone is a Christian. We love Christ, but we do nothing about him. Lukewarm. You cannot tell me I'm not a Christian. Who is more Christian than the other? That is for another day. The church of Smyrna, we are on the second church. And it will take us some background. The church of Smyrna was a church of persecution. Christians were persecuted. After the accession of Christ... You are aware that the disciples were persecuted, yes. 
But after that, Roman Empire wanted to do away with Christianity. So from 100 AD, you could not say that you are a Christian and live. And it became so rampant that Christians were killing Christians was a form of an amusement. If you want to amuse people in an arena, you call them and then you persecute Christians. And it is like the way we watch football today. You just tell people there is football, but there you are going to persecute Christians. And... Do you know, in the whole of that time, in all these churches, worshipping of idols was rampant. But in the church of Smyrna, it came to be the worship of the emperor. And you could not worship any other god before you worship the emperor. I hope you understand that. If you don't understand that, you won't get me. You may be allowed to worship any other god because it is polytheism. But you won't be accepted, it won't be accepted if you worship any other god before you worship. You do a sacrifice to the emperor. And the altar of sacrifice was in the city of Smyrna. Smyrna was a generally big city Today, by that time, when the letter was written by John, Smyrna was having a population of about 100,000. Today, Smyrna is the third largest city in Turkey. It's, it is called Izmir, third largest city in Turkey. It is called Izmir. It has a population by the year 2020 it had a population of about 4.4 million. That was Smyrna. The center of worship of the emperor was in Smyrna. You could not go and sacrifice to any other god before you come to Smyrna to sacrifice, offer sacrifice to the emperor. And therefore, people who were Christians and never wanted to sacrifice, they were persecuted and they were killed. The major forms of killing which they invented were you are put on a bed having nails. So you lie on a bed and you are lying on nails and they prick as they enter. You could be whipped and until it reaches the veins. The veins are cut and arteries are cut and then blood is let loose. And another way was to be put, hung on the cross. Another way was to take you to the theater at the arena where wild animals are and the wild animals would kill you. And it is a form of amusement to the people who are watching you. Because of that, the church of Smyrna, Smyrna in verse number nine, Jesus is telling the church you know, John is talking to the church in, in 96 AD when he's writing, he's completing to write the book of Revelation because John the Revelator died in the year 96 AD. John the Revelator was persecuted seriously by a king, by an emperor, and was banished to Patmos until a new emperor I think Navra came into power and released him, released all Christians 
who were put in prison. So Christ is telling us in verse 9, I know your afflictions and your poverty, but you are rich. Christians were persecuted, but Christ in the persecution is telling them, I know your afflictions. I know you are seemingly poor, but be of good cheer. You are rich. In the church of Smyrna, in verse number 10, the Bible is saying, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you into prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. You will suffer persecution for 10 days. In the whole of that period, 100 to 313, those are two, I think, 213 years, about 213 years, Christians suffered. But among, in between the period of the 213 years, Christ is telling the church, but you will suffer greatly for 10 days. By the year 165 B.C., a martyr called Polycarp of Smyrna was killed on the 23rd, on the 23rd of, still not yet on that yet, on the 23rd, on February 23rd. But he was the 12th to be martyred. And there were series of martyrs. You can give the series to us so that we can be able to see. There were many martyrs. I have only selected a few, like the Ignatius, like Polycarp of Smyrna, like Justin, like Plotemius and Luci Lu Lucius, and Papetua and Felistus have given the date there. 7th March 203, because we want to look at those two. Then we look at, at, at Polycarp of Smyrna. Origin of Alexandria, and many more. But the 12th was Polycarp of Smyrna, which we are going to look at after we have seen what happened to Papetua and Philistus. Papetua was a girl who was recently married, a girl of 22 years, and was recently married and was having a breastfeeding boy. She was captured with her slave called Philistus, who was also pregnant. And they were put in prison for some days because they confessed to be Christians. Because of that, Philistus was deeply hurt, feeling that she is in prison with a little boy who is breastfeeding. But there's nothing she could do. After some time, she got used to the, to the prison and was satisfied. But the father was very determined to tell her at least to offer sacrifice to, to the emperor so that she can be released. So the one time the father went to him to plead with him and told her, please accept and offer the sacrifice to the emperor. But she asked the father this question. Father, this is a verse. I don't know whether my pronunciation you will understand. V-A-S-E. Something to carry a flower. A verse. 
Then she asked the father, can you call it by any other name apart from what it is? The father said, no. It is like asking, this is a speaker or a monitor. Can you call it by any other name than what it is? The father said, no. Then she said, I am also the same. I am a Christian. Can you call a Christian by any other name if not being a Christian? The father was wroth with her. He went to her as if she, he was to remove, to pluck out the eyes. Then he left and went home very disappointed. After going home, after some days, the father came back again and, and, and talked to her and told her, my daughter, honor my gray hairs. Please, it will be shame to me with my fellow men. Think of your mother. Think of your brothers. I have treated you better than your brothers. Think of your aunt. Think of your son who cannot be able to survive without you. Then Papetua told the father, the Lord will do to me what he wills. The father was very disappointed. Then after that argument, the father went away. A day came when they were being brought to the judgment, uh, judgment seat. The father came and took the child. And Philistus and the fellow five were called. And they were asked, may you be able to offer the sacrifice? That is to worship the emperor. Then they said, we will not. Philistia said, I will not. The father threw her himself to her, hold her tightly, and pleaded with her, please offer the sacrifice. Offer for my sake. Philistia said, no, sorry, Perpetua said, I will not. The father decided not to leave her until she offers the sacrifice. Then the proconsul ordered the father to be taken and beaten. The father, father was beaten thoroughly. Papetua felt very bad as she saw the father being beaten. Then the father left with the child. The father didn't give, give up. He came again the fourth time. She, he took the daughter's hand and kissed the hand, talked to her nicely. Please, I plead with you, accept to offer the sacrifice. Papetua, say, Papetua said no. Then again, a day came. It came closer to the day of their execution. And as it was nearing the execution, which, which was to be on the 7th of March, the year 203 AD, they felt that it was very painful for Philistus, who was still pregnant, to remain without being killed when the others are being killed. Because they don't kill a woman with a child in the womb. So they felt that if Philistus remain, a holy blood will be shed later with other criminals. Better the holy blood is shed with other holy people. So they felt it was bitter unto them. And then Philistus was feeling that I better also join in to my blood to be shed with my fellow believers. So, on 
the 5th of March, two days to the execution day, they decided to pray. And after pray, fervent prayers, labor pain started. After it started, it was very painful. I'm being told that labor pains are very painful if it is coming for the eighth, ma eighth month, not the ninth month. Then it was very painful, but she gave back birth to a girl. After giving birth to a girl, the soldier, the attendant that saw her struggle in pain as she was giving birth, told her, if it is very painful unto you now with the child, how much more will it be painful to me when you will be given to the animals? Then she said, this pain I am suffering now myself. But that one, Jesus will be bearing the pain together with me. Then the execution day came and they marched to the arena. They were rejoicing as people who are going to heaven. And when they entered there, their dresses were removed and a net was put on them. And they had the, the animals were let loose to come on them. They had a man who was also called Saturus. Saturus. It is you, so I don't know the pronunciation well, but let me pronounce it like that. that. Saturus. And this man said, me, I want to be tested with several animals. Bring the lion. Bring the leopard. Bring the, the bear. He dreaded the bear more than all other animals. A leopard came, other animals came, they did nothing to him. A wild, a wild boar was brought to him, only dragged him, but did nothing to him. But the one who was releasing the wild boar was killed by it, was uh, injured by it, and died some few days later. But him, he was only, he was only bruised. Then later on, he was marched to the leopard. When the leopard came, he said, my death will be with the leopard. I know I'm going to the leopard and I will not come back. When the leopard came, the first bite, he was drenched into blood. And in the arena where people were watching, they said, well drenched, well drenched. You are drenched very well. They are pleased that he has been beaten by the, by the leopard. And then Satarus, when he was dying, where the wound was, he told the soldier, remember me. Remember the faith. But let this thing not traumatize you. Remember the faith. And again, when the soldier was still there, he told him, give me your ring. The soldier gave him his ring. He dipped into the blood of the wound and gave it back to him as a sign of remembrance. A heifer, a heifer. Heifer is a female animal. A mad one was released to go for Philistus and Pantua because they are female, so they are given a female animal, which is mad. It stumbled on them. They were crushed down. And, and you know, people were now feeling for it because they came for an amusement, but they are seeing a young girl, Papetua, being tossed by an heifer. And then they see a woman who just gave birth Milk is coming out of the breast. They say this one is too much. But they marched into it because they were soldiers who were defending the faith. And as they were marching in, um, they were not killed by the heifer but badly injured. 
So they were to go for the sword so that their throats could be slit. Papetua took the hand of the soldier and put the sword on her neck so that he can be killed. In the, 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 our Savior Christ Jesus is telling the church of Smyrna, I know your afflictions. I know your poverty, but you are rich. You are going through afflictions, but you are rich. Because just being called a Christian was a problem. Nowadays, we are all called Christians. Spiritual arrogancy. Do you know when this happened? The Bible is talking about you will suffer for 10 days. 10 days in prophecy a day means a year. Like you see in... You can get that. It is outside the scope of this lesson. But Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34 in prophecy a day means a year, especially prophetic years in Daniel and Revelation. So the Bible, God is telling, Jesus is telling them, you will, you will suffer persecution, but so much greatly for 10 days. There came an emperor in the year 303 up to 313 that killed Christians mercilessly until now when Constantine joins in the year 313 he decides to release Christians that you have suffered a lot, a lot. I want to make Christianity to be a state religion and that was the marriage of the church and the government and that is what stopped the persecution persecution was so great from the year 303 to the year 313 look at Polycarp the man Polycarp who was martyred in the year 155 he was an old man a man of 80, 86 years but they decided to call him and let him come so that he can be killed. So they sent soldiers to him. When he heard that, he went away for three days to another country. But on the third day, he heard that those people were coming to him. Those people came. He decided not to escape. They found two of his boys and they whipped them so that they can say where Polycarp was. And Polycarp decided not to run away. So they came to Polycarp. They found him in, on an upper room. Polycarp came down to meet them, greeted them, cheerfully greeted them. And then, after such greeting, most of them said, why have we come to this old man to arrest him and this man of God? They were really asking themselves, why have we come to this man of God? But he welcomed them and told them, please come for some food. He invited them for food and asked them, please give me one hour interrupted so that I can be able to pray. So he prayed for two hours. They allowed him. And it was a fervent prayer. When he came down for the arrest, it was very painful to the soldiers seeing that they were taking the old man away. And do you know what happened? When he was taken away, he was brought to the council and the proconsul asked him just to know whether he was the polycarp of Smyrna. Then he said yes. After he asked, said Yes, and the proconsul has considered that is yes. He said like this. No, a voice came to heaven and to him and a voice told him, please be strong and many other words. The proconsul asked him whether he was Polycarp. On hearing that he was, he tried to persuade him to 
apostatize, saying, have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, down with the days. Swear, I the proconsul. Reproach Christ and I will free you. Then Polycarp answered and said, for 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. For 86 years I have served Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ has done me no wrong. Why must I reproach him? How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? That is what Polycarp said. By the way, if he was 86 then, and it is in 155, when you come back you find that it, he was born in around, uh, he was about 30 years when John the Baptist was, was when John the, John, John, John the Revelator died. He was an apostle of John the Revelator. He, his faith had grown. So Polycarp said, for 86 years I have served my Savior. Why will I deny him today? Like me, let me not say my age, but I was baptized 37 years ago. I was baptized in 1987. So I can conf confidently say, for 37 years have I served him. Why will I deny my king and my savior? And then they took him. The following one is, he was told, I have wild animals here. The proconsul said, I will throw you to them if you do not repent. But he said, call them. Polycarp replied, if you despite the animals, I will have you burned. Then Polycarp said, you threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour. And it is then quenched. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Why are you waiting? Bring them. Bring on whatever you want. If you want to bring the animals, bring it. If you want to bring fire, bring it. The fire was lit. He removed his clothes. Then one person came to fix nail on him so that it can, he cannot run away when the fire is becoming hot and burning him. But he told him, leave me as I am. For he that gives me strength to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. And he was burnt. Christians have gone through painful moments in life. That is why <coughs> Christ is telling us in verse 10, Let me just say the last word. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Our forefathers went through a lot so that we can have the faith today. Why do we take this faith so lightly? When I see, I look at Polycarp, I look at Papetua, I look at Philistus, I remember John Huss. When he's being called and being told, please recount all your writings. Then he's saying, of all the things that I have written, I have nothing to recount because I wrote them to encourage people in the faith. I am ready to confirm this with my blood. 
and he was burnt, and the ashes were thrown into River Rhine. When he was going to be burnt, Jerome promised him, if they take you there, I will come there and rescue you. And then he tried to go, and he was captured, John Jerome. And John Jerome, when he was captured, he was fearful, and he, he said that I recant. The proconsul didn't believe him. He was taken back again to prison for one year. Then he was brought back to confess again. Are you still recanting and saying that you don't accept those writings? John the Jerome said, of all the sins that I have done since my youth, none of them weighs heavily on my heart than when I denied John Wycliffe and also denied John Haas, my master, on this arena. <coughs> Here I am. I can recant nothing. And John Jerome was burned at stake. The Bible is telling us, be faithful unto death. You can see this picture. I know you can see this picture. This is what I was talking about. The cruel death. People have come for an amusement in the arena. Wild animals are let loose so that people can see it and laugh and cheer and go home. Then they see Philistus being thrown up and down with the animal and milk coming out of the breast. And people felt that even though we are punishing Christians, it is not a good one. Why is it that today we can never hold the faith? Sin has taken us into captivity that we don't care about living a Christian life. We don't care to uphold the faith that we have today and to live for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Men and women have died when defending their Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is why Jesus is pleading with us and is saying, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. By the way, that is the topic that I was telling you. Holy faith. Believing your Savior. Walking with him. Loving him and trusting him. Our ancestors went through a lot for us to have the faith. Why is it that you live like an unchristian and you don't care? That is why the writer of this song, 3 or 4, is talking about this thing to us. And he's saying, him 304, and the writer is saying, faith of our fathers living still. That faith is still living. In spite of dungeon, fire, or sword, oh, how our hearts beat high with joy. I love always stanza two of that song, and it says, Our fathers chained in prison's dark were still in their conscience free. Our fathers were chained. But in their conscience, they were still free. How sweet would it be their children's fate. If them like if they like them could die for the Savior. That statement is saying what would be how sweet would be our fate when us today like our fathers we would accept to die for Christ's sake. I plead with you to have this faith. 
to have a holy faith, to die for your Savior, to accept your Savior, to walk with him, that Christ in the end may give us the crown of life. Those who feel that you love this holy faith, please stand up. You are willing to die. You are willing to walk with your Savior. Please stand up with him. As we sing song number 304,